everyone, it's Kristen, aka Miss Filmingo, here with a brand new exclusive interview. Today we are speaking to actor and director Nick Moran. Nick is no stranger to starring in big epic Hollywood films and in smaller independent films. Nick has appeared in The Musketeer, The Guy Ritchie film, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, but most notably he's appeared in the Harry Potter films. And he's also directed a few films himself. You guys are in for a treat because Nick is the director behind the latest film, Creation Stories. I got the chance to see it and it's a fantastic film. Creation Stories tells the unforgettable tale of the infamous Creations Records label head, Alan McGee, and how one offer in young Glaswegian upstart rose to incorruptibly change the face of British culture. And the film is jam-packed with music, featuring music from Oasis, Primal Scream, Teenage Fan Club, My Bloody Valentine, the Jesus and the Mary Chain, and of course, the one and only, the Sex Pistols. And for those who do not know, this film is actually based on the autobiography, Creation Stories, Riots, Raves, and Running. The film also happens to be executive produced by Danny Boyle, writer Ivan Welsh, and Ewan Bremer of Train Spotting. Bremner stars alongside an A-list cast including Leo Flanagan, Suki Waterhouse, Jason Isaacs, Jason Fleming, Paul Kay, and Richard Jacobson. And to all of our listeners, we encourage you to check out Creation Stories streaming on AMC+, Plus, available on demand and digital February 25th. So before we jump into our special interview with the one and only Nick Moran, I want to give him one last huge thank you for taking the time out of his busy schedule to speak with me, along with RLJ Entertainment for helping me put this interview together. And thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Go check out this film. It's a great Brit pop rock journey of a film you're really in for a ride with this one and go give the m and k productions podcast a follow on instagram go give mac a follow at mac movies and me a follow on twitter at k filmingo and now on to the interview hi nick it's so nice to meet you it's nice to meet you i was uh, checking out your website um before this it's really cool it's really, really cool. You've got some great people on this and people I know that you've interviewed as well, which is which is always nice. Oh, thank you. I'm it's it's so nice for you to say that. And I'm just even more excited to interview you. And I believe we have a connection already because um you are part of a Frank Sinatra tribute band. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did them. Um, uh, I, I haven't done it for a while, obviously, what with uh, okay. <laughs> what with COVID. But yeah, there was a yeah. There, there, we that for going for a while. The syndicate. Um, yeah, that's quite cool. Since Sinatra's from Jersey, I'm a Jersey girl. So whenever you get into the into that routine again, I have to come and see you because my family but, and what, I. Are... One of my one of my dear friends is Joey Pan, Joey Pantaleone, right? Joey Pants. Okay. And, and Joey Pants's father was a fireman with Sinatra's grandfather, right? And they're all part of this whole poking thing. So it's all this big whole poken look community. And when uh, when Joey, Joey did something, I think he did, they did uh, Here to Return to as a TV movie. And Joey Pants played Sinatra's role. And there's this famous okay. line about uh, that Sinatra said, you know, said, hey, you seen this kid? You seen that Joey Pants? You seen and he, and uh, Sinatra, ah, I pity that kid. Why? He ain't never going to be the most famous person from Hope Hogan. Which I don't know what that's not. <laughs> that's sort of summed it up. But yeah, I love that that New Jersey. I've got a few friends in New Jersey, and I love that sort of New Jersey sense of humor, that the New Jersey massive. So um, I haven't done it for a while. It was great fun. Maybe you know what we used to do. Our gag was we used to do, and this was years before anyone else did it. This was like 2002 or 2003. Frank Sinatra sings the greatest hits of the Sex Pistols. That was oh, the yeah. whole idea. So we had the whole band doing, I am an antichrist. But I'm from, I am an anarchist. Oh, oh my gosh, I, I love you this. You know, which is, uh, it ties in because that was a, the song that we use in Creation Stories when they, when they sing Anarchy in the UK. And it was a little in joke for me because I've done it with a big brass band as a Sinatra number. That was part of our act. Yeah, it's like, I don't know if it was like, a, it looked like one of the pandemic type things. Like there was like a whole like- Oh like, no, that, 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 uh, no, what that is, that, that was really cool. There's a woman from that band that now started a thing years later 
where it's you sing a song for um, for people with with Alzheimer's, you know, with uh, oh, so really so easy. she said, would you do a song for, you know, to and they play it in front uh, in old people's homes and try and get them to sing along. Now, they used to do it live. Then they started doing it on Zoom. And so, so she it was that the woman that played the violin was one of the musicians from the from the band when we used to do this, this crazy club night. Um, so yeah, that was quite sweet because you know my mum's uh, starting to come down with uh, oh. with Alzheimer's and it's it's not it's such a terrible thing and to be able to sing a song it just makes sense to those, those old people you know they clap along they, oh, they can yeah, remember they... words even though they can't remember what their children are called but they can remember the words to a song so yeah that's what that was that was lovely that was a really cute thing but um, now on stage with a you know with a two tone suit and a load of uh, brass sex that was that was yeah we'll do one day i'll get the band back together one day you got you, it. i'll, you I'll got let it. you know yeah let let us know we'll come out and uh now let's get into the film i really let's enjoyed the film. The film. yeah let's do the interview yeah <laughs> i just got so excited wrapped up in your fake snatcher worlds but um yeah let's talk about the film so the last film you did was back in like 2010 it's been a while so why work on this film now and why was the perfect time in 2019 because wow. i understand it was filmed then what, what, and what now a, it's what, being what, released what a very good question to start with well um, yes my i did um my first film was really well received everybody loved it i did a movie straight afterwards the kid which won a load of prizes did a load mm -hmm. of festivals in america and then there was this big lull because you get into a, a, a position and i'm sure other directors would have told you about this where you've made a couple of films and that's when everybody starts telling you lies <laughs> so that's when you start being <laughs> given scripts and you've flown over to 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 meet various people from big agencies or studios you've got an interview with with someone at Warner Brothers and blah, blah, blah. They just give you all these scripts. And, and the next thing you know, you haven't made anything and five years has gone by. You know, you've been attached to a movie. They Sometimes they even pay you. They're, sometimes they'll mm -hmm. pay you for a, a, a script idea of yours, but nothing actually happened. And it was just strange that I'd done two movies back to back with great, wonderful actors, you know, Rupert Friend and Natasha McElhorn and, you know, Kevin Spacey and, and, and James Corden and all these great people. And then and then I was attached to, to these movies that were sort of in the middle, in the sort of nether region, the sort of nowhere land that never happened. And then it got, when this film, I got approached to do this, which happened because... Alan McGee and Irving Welsh and all of the producers were such big fans of Telstar, my first film, which is very similar music mm -hmm. related biopic. Um, when they came to me with this and I, I saw an opportunity to, to make another train spotting. I was like, I can make mm -hmm. train spotting with this, with this. Um, if they give me the freedom and, and if Irving is, 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 which he was up for, you know, changing some of the aspects of it, then, um, I, I needed to make another film because and, and I did all I could to help make this come to life. It wasn't there was times where we lost the money, times when, when we lost investors or actors. And I just phone everyone up, get everybody I knew to try and you know make this thing a reality because I suddenly realized I'd spent 10, 10 years or nine years sat on my ass. You know, you don't realize it when people are telling you, you get a script, you read it, you're, mm -hmm. you're planning something to direct that never happens. So this one, I didn't want to let go of and I wanted to do all I could to make sure that it absolutely happened. But what a good question. No one's asked that. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I try my best to come up with these questions. Um, so uh, you go through a lot of bands exploring this film, especially Oasis. And once Wonderwall played, I was like, oh my gosh, this takes me back to like my childhood growing up because I was a 90s kid. So how difficult was it to song wise? Did you know which songs right away you wanted to include for the film? Or? One, or some, one or two that you have to uh, because, you know, people want them. But there was all sorts of things uh, that suddenly someone gets involved. I Somebody asked me this question earlier and I was explaining what a horrible jigsaw it can be with songs because someone who isn't in the band anymore might own part of the publishing rights and you can't get clearance for that because they're working in in home base or you know or home depot and you know they've you know they haven't been in a band for 20 years but they want this money and things become really complicated over the ownership of some songs so often there were songs that we wanted to use and, and we couldn't 
Um, but then that normally means that you have an opportunity to find something else, find something that's really interesting, find something that's um, a, a song that uh, that you can allow people to discover. So I think it, what's good about this soundtrack and and I was very, very lucky because I, I had so much input because it is an independent film. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be sat with the editor and in going, look, try this and madcap things like Napoleon the 13th, you know, they're coming to take you away. Ha ha. They're coming to take you away. He he ha ha. Nobody said, it's only me that's heard that song. Do you know what I mean? That's like going back to a million years. So I got to find some really strange, weird tunes and nobody's heard them and throw them in there. And so it was very much like my, my party tape, you know, but I, 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 one of the things I think works really well with the film, if you, if you give it a chance, is that it isn't just a load of anthem Britpop songs. There's some really interesting tunes you wouldn't have heard before. If you, da if you don't know the Sex Pistols, if you don't know the Damned, you know, those two punk classics. I was so pleased that we had those. If you don't know, um, uh, ride or, or or even the bmx bandits you know the um uh get some serious drugs you know all of those songs apart from the obvious crowd pleasers a teenage fan club the my bloody valentine tracks which i really had to fight to keep those in the film because people don't necessarily know that band but they're so important and and so i wanted to make it a mixture of 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 songs you know and songs you don't know and then of course the song some songs are just too expensive you yeah. can only have a few of them you know but the thing about wonderwall this is a whole movie right i'm going to sum the whole movie up now okay is, perfect <laughs> at, at the, the very the whole you've been through 106 106 minutes or whatever it is right at the end of the film at last it describes the film describes it it's a definition of what wonderwall is what it means when yeah. he says after all you're my wonderwall that's the thing that you push against is the thing that's holding you up. The idea that he's he's rebelling against his father. That's the thing that's driving him forwards and propping him up. And that's the Wonderwall. The whole film is just so we can explain at last. What does Wonderwall mean? You know, and that's that was the that was what I was so pleased with how all those bits fell into place when we finally did the assembly. And when that song comes in and it says, after all, you're my Wonderwall. And he's walking away from his dad, realizing that. He did, you know, he sort of hates him, but he loves him. And if it wasn't for him, he wouldn't be anywhere. He'd still be, staying, you know, living at home. So that was the, the, for me, one of the tiny little definitions of the movie is to explain what a wonder wall, taking an hour, taking 104 minutes that we've decided, we've told you what a wonder wall is at last. Okay, so I have one last one, final question for you. So you were, you brought up train spotting, and I absolutely love that. I immediately thought about that right away, but I also thought of John Carney's filmography with, you know, Sing Street, which that was recently released back in 2018. What other filmmakers inspired you to take on the project, and where did you draw inspiration from there? I, I draw my inspiration, well, re most recently were, were, is Adam McKay. Um, mm -hmm. I made everybody watch uh, Vice, because oh, I wanted brilliant. that sort of crazy vice is I think that creation stories it, vice is creation stories set in politics. You know, yeah. that, that way that you take a character and you, and you explain who he is and then you explain all the craziness around him. And it's from his perspective and the way that the real life people can sort of morph into caricatures and that the, the way that very strange things can suddenly happen in vice was a was a inspiration as as a as a rock and roll version of, of vice is what and i think he, he did it as well with with the long short he did it adam mckay's done it again with the don't look up oh, so yeah. you, you're taking this sort of um this surreal and macabre and 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 put that in what is a conventional uh, biopic so my inspirations, contemporary ones, were the Adam McKay stuff. Shamelessly, I let him, you know, I, I did that. And then my grounding, which was, you know, as the lead in in Guy Ritchie's first film, seeing that's when films, seeing that work, seeing Lock, Stock, and Two Smoke, Smoking Barrels come together, will always be something that I I um, have with me as a filmmaker. The way that you don't need money, you just need a good idea, and 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 you don't need you don't need special effect you just need energy and 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 humor and and i try to cram 
probably too many, but I crammed as many ideas into creation stories as I could. You know, if there was a way, if we needed to put the, the camera on the, you know, on the on the end of something ridiculous and get someone to hang out of a window, we did, you know, if if there's any shots that could be done in a strange way, then it, it explored it because we don't have we don't have the facilities to we can't film something normally and make it look spectacular because we don't have any extras we don't have any money and we don't you know it's a, it's a low budget film but what we can do is film something in a unique way and give it as much uh, interest and uh, and uh, as, and power as if it was done expensively so that's how you do a biopic about the biggest band in in the world without the money to get the extras without the money to, to you know so and i love the, the thing that adam mckay does as well which I, I i really really tried to incorporate was the the montage stuff and i i got a little bit of flack from some people that didn't get it that were saying yeah but if that's liam gallagher why are you showing the real liam gallagher well we know that that's not liam Gallagher. we yeah. know he's an actor pretending to be alan mcgee we know it's an actor pretending to be a, a pop star so Let's see the, the footage of them. And then we know it really happened that th this actually went on in the real world, not just within the world of the film. And I think the montage stuff as well was something that, uh, that I, I gleaned from from those guys. So filming wise, Danny Boyle and and uh, and Guy Ritchie and then the contemporary stuff. Uh, Ad, I love what Adam McKay has done. Um, there's a couple of other directors that I really, really like, um, but but those three guys are the ones that I think informed this film, and I got people to to you know I made them make reference to them. Oh wow, it's a great film overall, great cast, great story, and I learned a lot. I didn't know about creation stories until uh, this came to light, so thank you for sh giving me a, oh, you're welcome. insight you. to this thank history. You. I was lesson. really struggled because it's a sort of it's about the British epoch, you know, it's about the late nineties. And that was a time when I was um, cock of the walk. You know, I was a leading lock stock of two smoking barrels and gate crashing a load of parties and getting a load of free stuff off people. And 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 so I was there at that sort of cool Britannia uh, epoch. And I just wanted to try and recreate that. And obviously, it's nice to know that you don't have to be from this country to understand that that's what was going on over here. You know, when you were in in uh, wherever, where, where were you? Were you in um, New Jersey or when you were? I in, was in Jersey. I've been in Jersey all my life. I haven't lived since. <laughs> OK, well, while you were on the East Coast, um, uh, you get an idea of what what was going on in London when we had our five minute, minutes of it being the this sort of, you know, this sort of world cool place. Uh, it isn't anymore, believe me, but it was it was fun at the time. And I tried to recreate that a little bit. And if you if you get that and you're three thousand miles away, then I, then I, I'm, I'm very pleased. It makes me very happy that you appreciate that. Yes, of course. So thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope we cross paths again talking about another feature film of yours soon. Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple. There's one I've just done that I'm editing and then there's another one coming up later in the year. But I'll, I'll make a point of staying in touch. And please do, if you can, put the word out because this film needs to find an audience, you know, and it, it, it's I really, really appreciate that that, that, that you that you found it. But, you know, let other people find it as well. If you can help, I, I, I'd love you forever. Oh, well, you know, we'll be spreading the word out and we'll have this right. episode up and we'll talk about it as much as we can. So thank you so much. It was thank such you. an honor thank to you. speak it's with you.